All right, now that we have our introductory videos behind us, let's get started on the talented ball. So the first thing we need to do is talk about the directory structure that Steve has set up for us to keep all of our files nice and organized. After we spend a minute looking at that, we're then going to move into the world of Houdini, and we're going to start out with a very simple digital asset. We're going to focus on the creation of our floor digital asset. Now, the floor is where we're going to be setting our bleachers and stage and all of that. It's going to be an extremely, and I do mean extremely, simple network. But the idea is for us to start out nice and simple and work our way up into more complex networks. Of course, we are going to assume that everyone watching these videos have watched the Houdini Fundamental videos, but we'll still take things nice and slow. But trust me, by the time we get all the way down to the bleachers, things will be nice and complicated. So first, folder structures. Why are folder structures important? Well, when working with 3D scenes, you'll find yourself working with a lot of different file types. You could be working with various types of textures. You can be working with cached data. You could be working, of course, with your scene files. You could be working with sound files, etc. With all of these different file types, if you don't put some sort of thought into the directory structure in which we'll be saving these files, you can accidentally begin saving things in different locations, like let's say maybe on my C drive I have these files, and on my F drive I have those files, and Johnny happened to make some really cool textures, so I'm going to reach across the network to Johnny's hard drive and reference those textures. That's a really bad practice to get into. And I know most of you that are watching this video go, yes, yes, I understand. But I can't tell you how many beginners I've seen get into 3D and start a scene and not even give a second's thought to how am I going to save these? Where at? You know, just file save, first place I'm looking at, that looks good. And they end up with their files being saved all over the place. And then they get into a situation where they want to take their file maybe home if they're up at school or if they're at work. Maybe they want to move it over to a different computer. And they find themselves running into all sorts of troubles because of the various references they have that go all over the place. So having some sort of very clean directory structure is a very productive and important thing when working on 3D scenes. So let's spend just a second and talk about what Steve has got set up. First of all, if we take our gaze up here to the title bar in Houdini, you'll see where Steve has already saved a file. Basically, he started Houdini up, he went to file, save scene as, and saved out volume one underscore oh one dot hip nc file. Now, this is already saved up under a directory structure that he established before he even opened, opened Houdini up. Let's take a look at how he's got things set up. If I open up my C drive and come down here to projects, basically we started out with Steve creating a projects directory. Inside the projects directory, this is where we'll be creating all of our various projects. Now, we are working with TD Volume 1, it's the Talented Ball, and it's going to be broke up into Volume 1 and Volume 2. So instead of just having one folder called Talented Ball, we're going to be able to keep the two projects very focused in regards to what DVD the content's going to be on. And that's why you're seeing this as TD Volume 1 instead of the Talented Ball. But for you guys, call it the Talented Ball. It makes a lot more sense. So if we jump into this particular project, you'll see that we've got three different folders in here. We've got an OTLs folder, a scenes folder, and a textures folder. Our OTLs folder, this is basically our operator type libraries. This is where we'll be storing all of our custom OTL files. And in our OTL files is where we'll be saving our digital assets. Now, we, of course, could save all of our digital assets into a single OTL file. But in this particular case, we're going to be saving out all of our assets into individual OTL files just in case an artist in the future wanted to take just one of those digital assets and install it on another computer. They would not need to bring all of the different assets that we create through the TD Volume 1 and Volume 2 DVDs. They could just create the one asset that they are interested in. But of course, always keep in mind, we can store all of the assets in a single OTL. Now our scenes folder, our scenes folder is where we will be storing all of our scenes files. You'll notice up here again on the title bar in Houdini. So C projects, uh, TD volume one, scenes, and there is the volume 101 hip file. So if we jump up under scenes, there is the file that is currently open inside of Houdini. Let's go ahead and jump up again and textures. We've already got all of the textures that we will be using for the talented ball saved here in this folder. Again, it's a good idea to keep everything nice and organized. And that's really all of the time that I want to spend talking about a folder structure. The bottom line is it's very important to have one anytime you start a new 3D scene. Think about it, set one up, 
and then use it. It's very easy to set one up and still accidentally reference files that are not in your particular directory structure. Make sure those files get copied into the directory structure and then reference them so that everything acts as a single unit if you want to pick it up and move it elsewhere. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's now go ahead and turn our attention over to Houdini. So by the end of this video, I wanted us to have the floor digital asset done. Let's go ahead and jump over onto the whiteboard for just a minute, and let's talk about the different OTL files that we're going to be creating over the next few videos. So in this video here, we are interested in creating a floor. So the floor digital asset is going to be stored in the floor.otl file. Now, the different things that we're going to be creating as these videos progress, not only is it going to be the floor, but we're going to have the stage. And once again, I'm not going to write the .otl, but you could proceed all of these uh, with OTL. Uh, character. So that'll be our bouncing ball, our pool, our ladder. And finally, our bleachers. Very cool. Okay, so once again, one digital asset will be stored in each of these OTL files. If for some reason we needed a ladder in a different project that was being worked on by a different artist, we could simply give that artist the ladder.otl file. They can install it, and then they have access to the custom ladder operator that we're going to be creating. So what Steve's about to do in just a second is in object level, he's going to create a node. He's going to basically put down a geometry container, and he's going to name the geometry container floor. So let me go ahead and just draw out. Of course, we know our nodes are nice and small, but this will allow me to show you the various nodes encompassed inside of this container node. So here we are. It's a geometry node, and Steve's going to name it floor. At least I hope he's going to name it floor. I think I'll name it floor. And when we jump down inside, of course, now we're working at the SOPS level, Steve is going to simply create a grid, and then he's going to wire the grid into a material node. And I'll just write Matt down. Now, we obviously need some sort of material that we can apply to the grid. The idea here is for us to create a digital asset, basically a single operator where everything is encompassed inside. We can hand it off to somebody else. They can put it down, and they don't need to worry about anything other than the parameters that we make available to them. So we're going to need to have access to some sort of material, and we need it to be encapsulated in the digital asset. So what Steve is going to do is create a shop network in here. So I'll just write shop. And inside, I'll just use this to represent inside the shop network, He's going to be creating a VEX super material. VEX super material, very simple, allowing us access to a few different lighting models. And then we have the uh, standard colors like ambient, diffuse, specular, and then some parameters that will be very useful for us. Again, this is just kind of an all-encompassing type material, and it's a good one to start out with for this particular project. Now, we'll obviously have our material reference this guy. And once we've got that set up, we now have a simple colored floor. Steve's going to take and select all of this, and he's going to collapse it down to a subnet that he can then turn into a digital asset. So I'll go ahead and just kind of draw it like such, in which he will call floor. Or at least I believe you'll call it floor. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and that's pretty much going to be it. Then for the parameters that will be promoted up to the top level on the digital asset, things like the grid size, um, the diffuse color, uh, specular color. Yeah, nice and simple. Just nice a few parameters simple. just to give a very basic digital asset. Now, once again, I am hoping that everyone that's watching this video has gone through all of the Houdini fundamental videos. And if you've gone through all of the Houdini fundamental videos, watching this being drawn out on the whiteboard makes you go, oh, that's extremely simple. That's the idea. We want to start simple here as a quick review and work our way up to more complex stuff. So with this all laid out, I'm going to give control over to Steve. We're going to jump over here into Houdini. And Steve, let's go ahead and start out with the creation of a geometry container node. 
Very cool. So I'm going to come over to our network editor and push tab to bring up the tab menu. And as a reminder, this um, uh, go ahead and start typing out. From time to time, this uh, menu that's going to fly yeah, off it, the net. it kind of breaks. It kind of breaks, goes off scene because we are, of course, using uh, 9.5. Yes. It's, it's still in beta. Yes. So as, uh, as Steve types out the particular note, I just want to make sure that everybody focuses on this area right here. Because you're going to see... Because, yeah, sometimes this slide that doesn't actually show up. No, it just flies off the screen. Mm -hmm. So, all right, go ahead. Cool. So I've uh, pushed tab to bring up the tab menu. I started typing geo to get geometry. I'm going to push enter to select that. Enter again to drop that into our network editor. If I double click on the name, I can rename this guy to floor. And then push enter to jump inside. And delete to get rid of the file swap that comes in by default. Instead, I'm going to bring up the tab menu again and create a grid. And I'll double click on the name and rename the grid to floor grid. I'm just going to leave the grid with its default parameters right now. I will hide out the construction plane just so that we just have our grid in okay. the view. So I'm going to right click on the output of the grid so that we can wire it into a material sop and enter to place that into the scene. And we currently don't have a material to assign to our grid. So let's create our shop network and then we can create our material inside and come back up in the side. And again, the reason we're creating the shop network inside the floor geometry containers is because we want everything referenced relatively. Exactly. So that when we create the digital asset, everything goes along for the ride. Fantastic. So I'm going to push tab and bring up the tab menu and type shop. So we get shop network. Enter to select that. Enter to create that in our network editor. And I'll rena uh, rename this guy to floor shop. If I push enter, we'll jump down inside. We're now in the shaders context, so we can create our materials and shaders. So I'm going to create a vex super material. There we go with the uh, tab menu breaking. Yeah. But you can see up here, vex super material. There we go. I had to click on vex super material at the top of the tab menu to actually get that to accept. And then enter to place that into the scene. I'm going to rename this guy to M underscore floor. Just for me personally, I'm going to use the naming convention M underscore to mean material. So I'm going to name this guy M underscore floor, meaning it's the floor material. And we have a, a few basic parameters that I'm going to set up. Our diffuse color. I want this guy to be a carpet type material, deep maroon red. So the diffuse color will choose a, a deep maroon red. And uh, since it's carpet, we don't want it to be very specular because carpet's not shiny like metal. So let's grab our specular color and drop this down almost to black. We have access to a couple of other parameters that deal with diffuse and specular, and that's the diffuse rough and specular rough. Diffuse rough um, basically defines how much light the surface scatters. Um, we can think of it as, as we boost this up higher, it's going to scatter light in all directions, meaning the surface is going to appear flat. So a little bit of uh, diffuse rough is going to be ideal for a carpet since it is a, a matte surface. It does diffuse light quite a lot. But obviously it doesn't appear flat like a the moon appears flat. So we don't want to boost that right up to one because we'd lose any shape on our uh, surface. Specular, on the other hand, on a carpet really does get um, scattered all over the place. It's, there's no definite highlights on a carpet. So let's boost this up really quite high. They're the only parameters I'm going to set for now on this shader. We're just going to keep things nice and simple. Okay. So I'm going to push U to jump up back to SOP level. And on the material SOP that we created, we can now specify that material using our um, operator browser. So I'm going to click on the operator browser next to the material parameter. Again, we're down on the material SOP. And I'm going to grab the M underscore floor material. Now, before I click accept... I'm going to check export relative path. And what this is going to do, instead of into this parameter giving us forward slash obj, forward slash floor, forward slash floor shop, forward slash m underscore floor, which is an absolute path, it's going to export the relative path, which means, let's click accept, we get dot dot slash taking us from this particular node up to its parent floor, then forward slash floor shop, then forward slash our material. So it's relative to this node as opposed to being absolute, which is essential because we're building an asset. We don't know where that asset's going to be placed. If everything's relative, then everything will still work no matter where we create our asset. Exactly. So with that in place, we can see the material and uh, the effects of that material in the viewport. And we can grab all of these nodes by single left click, dragging a marquee around them. And I'll right click in empty space. We can collapse them down. That's going to collapse those nodes into a subnet, which I will rename to floor. 
If we right click on that subnet, we can choose to create a digital asset out of this subnet. Now the operator name needs to be unique across all scene files. I'm going to go with the name floor. The operator label appears in our tab menu and it will appear in our parameter editor. And I'm going to go with floor with a capital F. It seems uh, logical enough. We don't need any inputs because we don't need to feed anything into our asset for it to do its job. So I'll leave both of those at zero. And instead of saving to the OP custom to OTL, here's where we're going to create our new OTL file in the project folder that we've already set up. So I'm going to click on this button to browse. And uh, the hip file is already saved to um, slash scenes within our project. So if I jump up to the parent, we can now go into our OTLs folder. And within there, I'm going to create floor dot OTL. If we click accept, I'm going to choose to say uh, install this only to the current hip file because all the time we're working with this particular hip file, um, that's the only place we're really going to need this floor installed. So if we were to start up a new Houdini scene and we wanted to get access to our floor, we'd have to manually install our floor to OTL as opposed to having it automatically installed, which we'd get if we chose to install it to scanned OTL directories. So I'm going to only install it to our current HIP file and click accept and that will bring up the type properties for our asset. So from the type properties dialog, if we jump to the parameters tab, we can choose some of our parameters to promote up. This is going to be nice and simple. So we can create parameters from nodes, creating them from the existing nodes that are in our asset. Come down to floor and uh, on our floor grid, we're going to have the size parameter that we want to promote. So let's grab size up under floor grid. And before I bring him over, I want to make sure that I uncheck the prefix uh, names and labels because I don't want the fact that floor the uh, parameter belongs to floor grid to be indicated in the name and the label. I'm simply happy for it to just be called size. So if I click on the right button, size will come over. If I click apply and just minimize this down for a second, we can see that we get the size parameter added to our asset. And if we jump inside and select our grid, we can see the size of the grid is now being controlled by the parameter that's been created. So let's bring back up our type properties and do a similar uh, promotion for some of our shader parameters. So up under our shop network, inside the floor material, inside the shader folder, we'll find the diffuse color that we'd already um, used to control the shader. The specular color, I'm holding control to select multiple items. The diffuse rough and the specular rough, the four parameters that we showed uh, earlier when we were setting up the shader. If you were to want to use any other parameters, you can simply select those as well. If you only wanted to promote, say, the diffuse color, you, you have complete flexibility over what you promote and what you don't. So I'm going to grab those four, promote them up to the asset, and click accept. And we can see if we jump up, we have our diffuse color, specular color, diffuse and specular rough. And we can grab our diffuse color up on the asset. Or if we were to change this to a different color, you can see it's affecting the network underneath. So I'm just going to click on the old color swatch to replace that back with what we had originally. So that's actually all of the work for the asset. So let's save our asset definition back onto disk. Let's to go ahead and take update. note of the color real quick as well of the word floor. Yeah, currently it's red, which means that we can jump inside, we can edit anything, we can create new nodes, we could change our visibility if we wanted. When we right click and save, it's going to take whatever we've already defined and save that to disk back into our floor OTL, which as soon as I moved my mouse, it disappeared. It actually showed that it had saved into floor.otl down in the help bar. So now that we've got that saved, we can right click and we can say match current definition. And what that's going to do is going to take the OTL that's on disk, which we know is up to date, we've just saved it. And it's going to update our scene to have whatever is on disk as our OTL, which basically means we're going to see no real changes because on disk has just been updated to match what we've got here. Um, if I could say that even more confusingly, that would be awesome. Basically, we've just saved out to disk. Then we're going to take whatever is on disk, the current definition, and replace our scene file with that version, our uh, well, asset we, in the scene with that the version. The reason you're doing that, we get one extra thing out of this. We do. And when we click on match current definition, we'll see that our asset is now locked for changes. If we jump inside, we can't change parameters we can't change the visibility. And that means that we can hand this scene file over to an artist. An artist can come in, change all the parameters at asset level, but they can't break the asset. They can't jump in and, and change anything. If they did want to jump in and change something, you can right click and come down to allow editing of contents. This guy changes back to being red and we can jump inside and change things. So I'm going to push you to jump back up and match current definition again, locking it out. Very nice. 
And with that, that's pretty much everything that we needed to cover just to get things kicked off. Once again, we took a look at the folder structure that Steve set up to keep all of our files organized uh, with. And also, we created the Floor Digital Asset and saved it into its own custom OTL file. And with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.